Yeah, welcome back to Think Tech here on a given Monday morning. It's Global Connections, and we have Professor Taiyun Baik. He is professor at the William S. Richardson School of Law. Uh, good morning, Taiyun. How are you? Uh, good, good morning, Jay. Good to see you again. How are you? I'm doing I'm good. Okay. I'm still healthy, knock wood, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So uh, you know, before we get to the subject in chief, which is the Korea experience um, on coronavirus, uh, I wanted to ask you about um, this conference you were involved in last week for, I guess, most or all of last week um, using Skype. Can you talk about how that worked and who was there and how they handled it? Yeah, as you know, I'm a member of a UN working group on enforced or involuntary disappearances. And this working group is composed of five people who represent five different regions of the world. Uh, we were supposed to have a session in Costa Rica uh, at this time, but because of this COVID-19 situation, we could not conduct the actual session. So we decided to have a little bit of a modified uh, remote session through Skype uh, for business. And uh, along with those five uh, members, we have a secretariat who are working in Geneva, and uh, they are also working from home. So all five secretariat members assisting us also through this uh, Skype. And uh, it was kind of amazing uh, experience. And we, initially we did not think it will be so effective, but everybody uh, followed all of the modified work procedure, uh, preparing all of the memorandum in advance or talking point prepared uh, sh shared in advance. So. Uh, even if we had a two-hour meeting per day for a week, we have done quite a significant work, including a review of uh, 500, more than 500 cases from 26 countries, and also discussion on various aspects of enforced disappearances. Unfortunately, it's continuing even at this time. Or sometimes mm -hmm. in some country, because of this COVID-19, it is getting worse. Yeah, well, just for a moment, let me ask you, where is it getting worse? Who are the uh, principal offenders these days in terms of countries in which mis mysterious disappearances uh, take place? Yeah, it, it, in first disappearances is, is basically uh, abduction or some other form of uh, uh, de deprivation of a liberty of the people by the government or governmental entity. So uh, those countries who are, you know, uh, blaming, blamed for this enforced disappearances are everywhere. Currently under our system, more than 100 countries have uh, enforced disappearances cases. Mm -hmm. And uh, many of those cases are involved with the domestic conflict or uh, internal security act, or sometimes transnational abduction is also happening. And uh, because of this COVID-19 situation, security forces are given more power than usual. So yeah. I not mention specific country at this time, but uh, apparently in some usual, uh, usually blamed for country are doing, using this for other, you know, additional kind of arrests and uh, uh, the conducting this uh, bad uh, criminal activities. Mm. To, our, to our viewers for a moment, uh, Taiyung and I had a, a show about this, it must be about a year ago, I think. Uh, where we discussed his work for the United Nations in this area. So if you want to know more, take a look at Think Tech and look us up. Taiyun Bike, B-A-I-K, Bike. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so Taiyun, uh, the principal discussion this morning is, is about Korea and COVID. I mean, Korea has done a remarkable job. And my, just my cursory reading on it suggests that one of the reasons is that it has a growing uh, biotech industry, which was able to uh, generate the tests. And the other is that people cooperated, um, you know, with the testing and the tracking, uh, even if it meant giving up some of their privacy. And as a result, um, you were able, uh, South Korea was able to stamp out COVID pretty quickly. Can you talk about what happened? Uh, actually, as you said, uh, South Korea had been stricken hardly uh, at the first stage of this COVID-19 virus spreading. And uh, I was uh, kind of shocked that, that uh, most countries were blocking uh, South Korean travelers in around two or three months ago because of the 
the rapid spreading of virus in uh, in Korea after China. However, currently South Korea is successfully containing the COVID-19 virus. And it is, I think, because of the approach that South Korea had taken. In my opinion, there are two different way of fighting against this uh, COVID-19. One is to focus on the infection or infect the people who are infected or exposed. And another approach probably would be a prevention focused approach. And South Korea had taken the more seriously about the uh, testing and contact tracing of those infected people or exp uh, people who are exposed to the virus. And they trans uh, shared the information in a very transparent manner. And uh, they uh, continued the, the isolation, self-isolation, or uh, even uh, according to their law, uh, the quarantine, which are uh, mandatory uh, if they are found to be a patient. And under Korean law that they adopted after uh, 2015 experience of MERS, so-called Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. Yeah, there was an outbreak of MERS then, and uh, and I think 38 people died as a result, yeah? Exactly. And at the time, South Korea learned the uh, you know, lesson in a very hard way because they didn't know this kind of immediate response uh, of uh, checking and tracing is so crucial. It was it started with only one businessman, but it had spread out so rapidly, and South Korea could not you know, control it in, in a very short period of time. So it took around 17,000 testing within two months for them to end it. So after that experience, they decided to uh, give the Korean CDC more power uh, to do more aggressive, take more aggressive measures in terms of uh, tracing people. Once a person is found to be infected or contracted, they can uh, look at some of their uh, personal information, which is uh, uh, you know, uh, given uh, according to the law that they uh, legislated at the time. This actually turns out to be a lucky break. But now you're involved in human rights. Um, your whole life is a study of human rights and civil rights and, and uh, privacy. Um, how do you feel about um, you know, individuals giving up their privacy and allowing the government to uh, get and use uh, all their personal information? Like for example, my understanding is that the way uh, the government works is it, it is able to get your cell phone GPS location it is able to get your credit card records and essentially know where you have been and what you have done. Uh, and now it uses that for tracking. But what about the civil rights aspect of it? That's a very important uh, question. And uh, as you know, I'm uh, very, uh, uh, you know, very much concerned about uh, those uh, infringement of fundamental human rights or constitutional rights. And under South Korean constitution, Article 37.2, there are several exceptions when fundamental rights can be infringed. And one is a national security concern, and another is public health concerns. Actually, it is not only in South Korean law, but also in the US law, and even UN, uh, ISIS, civil and political rights covenant also allows that exception. So as long as those exceptions are used uh, in a very cautious way, uh, fully protecting uh, other rights, uh, it is not against the legal system. And in South Korea, uh, uh, in 2015, they uh, changed, amended their law uh, so that they can confirm their constitutional provision. And uh, the way how South Korean uh, KCDC and also municipal government is uh, uh, tracing the, the possible uh, spreading or transmission of disease is also still very much concerned, uh, I mean, uh, uh, following this standard and of course, if it is abused and if it is uh, used in one way or another for other purposes, it will be really disastrous. However, in Korea, fortunately, uh, we have seen a kind of a tremendous democratization process and people's trust uh, to those, those uh, administration who are uh, leading this fight uh, is also a very important part. And people really uh, uh, relying on the information 
uh, transmitted by the government through SNS message or television network or other alerts, they did try to social distancing uh, on their own, not being imposed by any uh, legal measure, which is, I think, a very important point because South Korea had seen a lot of military dictatorship or governmental intervention of people's ordinary life. And they, I think, could not accept the lockdown if it was uh, abruptly imposed over all businesses. People in South Korea would have been really uh, angry about that. But if they are focusing on those infected people, and if they want to share the information only for uh, to protect the society as a whole, people are ready to and is accepted because of their 2015 experience. Coming back to this situation, uh, can I just add one more word? Yes. Uh, in the US, we also have a legal system under our constitution and also communicative disease uh, related federal law and state law allows us uh, to take a reasonable measure if it is a compelling governmental interest involved and or in some area it is if it is, it is a reasonable kind of measure to take so however we chose more focusing on general prevention rather than specific kind of testing and tracing so i'm not sure whether we had taken the, the best strategy at the first stage mm, yeah I, I, let me drill down on that for a minute <clears throat> so you're saying that legally in the united states they could do the same thing as uh, Korea did. Um, they could get uh, phone records, um, they could get uh, credit card records because it's, an, it's, a, it's a national uh, health uh, emergency. But the government here has not done that. Um, well, I, yeah, I, there could be a little bit of a uh, nuanced difference, I should say. Under current uh, South Korean Infectious Disease Control Act, uh, those KCDC may access to those uh, uh, mobile phone information if a person is uh, found infected without getting a uh, warrant from the court. So it, it is a kind of huge aggressive uh, measure that allowed. I don't think in, in the United States there is any uh, specific law that gave the power uh, that uh, we can do collect the information without the arrest warrant. But as I said, it is an exceptional situation. And if there is a, a ground for exception, we can do that. And my opinion, lockdown, locking down business is something similar. And it is not impossible in the US legal system. Yeah, clearly. So uh, one, one very interesting um, um, sort of oblique on this is that a month, a month ago, Google and Apple announced they were collaborating on a tracking system uh, which was based on uh, the GPS um, of, the, of the telephones, the smartphones. Um, and they worked on it for a month and then they came up with an app. But the government, my understanding, but the government said no because the government felt that this was intrusive um, and it was, uh, the government was not going to participate in it. So uh, at least at this point in time, uh, the app is not functioning. I, I find that regrettable because uh, Google, and, uh, Google and Apple certainly could have did do an app that would have um, used this kind of GPS information uh, mm -hmm. to great benefit in the United States, but we, we don't have the benefit of that. Yeah, in fact, uh, in South, even in South Korea, uh, to uh, request to use those uh, mobile phone app to trace the individual's isolation status or others are not requested or done by the law. In many cases, they are uh, voluntary kind of basis. So when uh, a new arrival, uh, arrival uh, arrive, newly arrived people arrives in South Korea in the airport from foreign country, they then they request to allow uh, to install the app so that they can uh, frequently trace their bodily temperature and also report it back so that once they see some symptom, they can immediately get tested. So uh, even in the United States, uh, I think uh, some, some uh, measure could have been taken, but we should acknowledge that it is a huge work because once you get the data, there should be people who are working on those data and helping those people who are tracing them. In South Korea, all kind of uh, governmental uh, administrative bodies, including municipal bodies and law enforcement agents work together 
to trace uh, those uh, information to share it with the public. So recently in Itaewon, there is one person who visited several nightclubs. And uh, now two weeks has passed and they had, had uh, successfully contained in by now, but to do that, they tested 16,000 uh, kind of test uh, people who were around the, the area. And uh, those information uh, actually were broadcasted publicly that the, these nightclubs were the, the, the infected places and people who visited there should do voluntary check and the government waived the, the identity kind of disclosing you know, the requirement. So everybody can go to check anonymously. So it, it is a really kind of a, approaches that a different approaches that they are taking sharing information in a transparent manner, allowing people more tools to you know, uh, avoid uh, any further uh, spreading and the transmission, which is, I think, a very important point for us to think about. So how much is that is derived from the experience that South Korea had in 2015 with the MERS virus? Uh, and how much do you think is um, sort of culturally resonant? where people decide that something is important, so they work together and they collaborate uh, between governments, individuals, institutions, and as you have seen here recently in Korea. So it depends on the definition of a culture, but I would not say it is because of Korean culture, rather it was a very hard learned Korean experience based upon MERS, and also as you may remember, the tragedy of a sunken ferry where 400 young students were uh, actually uh, drowned to death because of the lack of governmental immediate uh, focused uh, measures. And also uh, another other background is that South Korea is heavily networked society. Everybody has access to internet and mobile phone is everywhere and people are very highly educated and they are kind of uh, accustomed to respond to social agenda if it is properly directed and it is trans uh, shared in a transparent manner. And they are ready to kind of uh, cooperate with the leadership if the measure is uh, getting some consensus of the people. And the South Korean government had been somewhat successful in persuading all of the society uh, that you know, this is uh, some necessary measure and people had to cooperate. So I will not say this is because of South Korean specific culture, rather it is a combination of everything. And in Hawaii, we also have a high internet and very good networks and other, you know, very well trained and educated people. So I think we can also do it. Yeah, well, we should be proud, but also the South Korea should be proud. You should be proud, huh? Yeah, I am actually, yeah. but I'm, I'm still not too much optimistic because uh, three days later, they will start to open the high school and gradually middle school and elementary schools. And uh, they are already kind of starting to loosen a little bit. And uh, I hope uh, the, they will not see another big outbreak. So it should be still a matter that everybody should approach in a very cautious way. Yeah, I'm sure everybody is watching it very carefully, but let me let me talk to you more about the mechanics. Mm -hmm. um, so who get under the system in South Korea as it has evolved over the past couple of months? Who gets tested? What are the parameters, uh, the criteria for testing? That's an important question. In fact, uh, at the first stage, uh, those testing kit was uh, not as uh, well advanced as we see at this time. And it was not so much abundant at the time. So they were more focused on those infected or those who had been exposed to those infected people. And, this, and gradually they expanded it toward the, the more uh, people surrounding that infected or exposed people. And uh, uh, later, they also found developed a more rapid uh, test, testing kit. So initially it took several days, but later on it took 50 minutes, now 10 minutes. And with a drive-through uh, testing, uh, they are now allowing virtually everybody if they have some reason for them to test. And of course, uh, if they found to be patient infected, uh, they do not charge any. And mm -hmm. if there's no ground for them to test, but if they wanted to test, uh, they probably will charge around uh, $120 or something. 
but apparently it's quite different in that everybody feel that they are you know given op option to test if there's any reason in the united states especially in hawaii we had a uh, difficulties in early stage because of delayed delivery and faulty kits. And uh, even at this time, I'm not sure whether everybody can uh, have the test, which if we in the future open up our business and if we uh, want to return back uh, to from this uh, very extreme social distancing, we should find a way to enhance the testing and also tracing. So we should know where are the cluster located, and where you should avoid to go, or what kind of a additional measure we should take, disinfecting and others. So we are still in need of some more information to completely conquer this current situation. Mm -hmm. In South Korea, everybody think that they know where it is uh, going on and of course the privacy information they try to hide as much as possible but uh, sometimes uh, there has been some hatred against some religious group developed or some lgbt community developed but it is an education process i think so they have a lot to develop further in terms of a social kind of a, you know atmosphere to completely pro protect those minority uh, groups as well so uh, um, yeah, it's really remarkable how successful the testing has been. And I recall reading that originally at the very outset, uh, um, Korea, South Korea had some trouble with the testing. I think, I think they were following the CDC, the American CDC testing, and that, and that uh, was not helping them. So they developed their own because they have a, a strong biochemical research uh, industry in, in um, South Korea. But here's the thing. So now you find in the process of this testing that somebody tests positive. Okay, now we want to bring all those analytical analytical tools together, mm -hmm. um, use all the technology that we can do. And, you know, as you said, Korea is, uh, is advanced in the internet, it's advanced in information technology. So, um, you know, like, for example, in the case of that nightclub, uh, it was, it was, it was revealed, it was revealed. Mm -hmm. um, so how do you how do you use this information in order to in order to limit any further infection? Uh, what's the, what's the tracking technique and what affirmative steps did South Korea take in order in order to you know suppress any further infection? So the, in the case of uh, Itaewon nightclub situation, they tr try to identify uh, as much as as much as possible who were uh, directly in the light nightclub and who were possibly contracted uh, to the virus by uh, tracing uh, credit card information. If a person paid the, uh, the nightclub entry fee with a credit card, then they can get uh, at least the, the information that the person was there. And also they did try to use a CCTV so that they can identify the person uh, who were there. And also, they use the, the mobile phone uh, location, uh, GPS information, so that they can blast the, the mass alert email. So there has been this break outbreak of this huge uh, new uh, COVID-19 patients. Since you, we think you could have been in the nightclub or around the area, try to identify whether you have any symptom. And if you feel you, you have a symptom, go to nearby health services uh, that it, you can test for free and uh, even anonymously. So by using those information to uh, kind of a, a share the, uh, I mean, to, to let people know uh, to decide what to do. Those were one thing, impo one important measure that they have taken. And additionally, once a person is found infected, they did uh, try to identify the places that the person had visited or the, the people the person had met uh, by uh, interviews, on and on interviews. And uh, those information, again, had been shared with uh, uh, relevant uh, companies or private school institutions and others. So for that uh, one person, uh, a case started with one person, they tested 16,000 people uh, with uh, this uh, two-week period. It's amazing. But by doing that, now they have only six, 16 cases daily again, and eight of them is uh, uh, are related to this uh, nightclub.
So they are successful in terms of uh, containing it because of this tracing and sharing information. And also if they had been contracted, even if the, they do not have a symptom, they generally uh, try to do self-isolation, not uh, quarantine because they are not uh, uh, still infected. And if they develop real symptom and find positive, uh, you know, tested positive, then they are sent to hospital immediately. So it is uh, also a combination of uh, tracing and treatment and also uh, kind of isolation and quarantine process all combined. So it is uh, on the one hand, uh, governmental leadership, but on the other hand, I think the people's the voluntary participation based upon full information. And I think that is something remarkable we uh, now see. And diagnos diagnosis, is, of course, is a starting point. So again, we can emphasize here in Hawaii and the United States, diagnosis and tracing should be something that we should consider more seriously at this point. Yeah. I, I sure like the idea of taking, if you find somebody infected, sending him to the hospital right away and, tre and treating him to the extent you can. But one thing, you know, that's been missing in the United States, and I wonder if it's also something that would help in Korea, or maybe Korea is already doing it, is multiple testing. In other words, you test once and you don't know for sure because um, maybe it's too early in the course of the disease, the infection, or that the person you tested is actually exposed the next day. And uh, you know, a few days later, if you test him a few days later, you'll find that maybe he is infected. And how do you deal with that problem? Is there secondary testing going on? Has it helped? Would it help? Yes, of course. So for those who are exposed, but still not infected, they are under the self-isolation stage. So initially they may have a test negative, but after several days, if they develop symptoms, they will test again. And it will probably, if they, the person is found to be positive, the person probably will be taken to the hospital. And if a person is infected and, and uh, hospitalized, uh, during those uh, hospitalization process of two or three weeks, they test multiple times. And only when they found the negative, then they are kind of allowed to you know, release from the hospitalization. And furthermore, these days we have reports that after release, because they are now negative, again, the so positive uh, results are coming out. But Today I saw from South Korean newspaper that they do not, they found that those people are not uh, infecting any further. It was a kind of a remained, remaining virus that is, does not have that uh, power to transmit further. So mm. I think this, uh, this uh, abundance uh, opportunity to test is a really important part. Yeah, and, and well, we, we, have, we have issues in the United States, you know the story in Michigan. Um, where people are opposing this, sort of the anti-vax approach, uh, and we don't believe in testing, we don't believe in science and all, um, and, and that's very troublesome. So what, what happened in Korea is not likely to happen in the same way in the United States. At the same time, Taiyu, <clears throat> uh, Korea has been willing to share its lessons. It mm -hmm. has been transparent, it has been very altruistic in in, uh, in teaching and showing other countries um, how to do this. Um, and I wonder what your thoughts are about whether the United States could learn and what specifically could it, should it learn from Korea and whether it will learn from Korea and whether maybe it's too late to learn from Korea. Uh, I, first of all, I would like to point out that the United States had already learned a lot last you know, couple of months, uh, you know, not only by South Korea, but also by other successful countries who contained this COVID. But uh, it is one important thing that uh, we can learn from South Korea is the importance of the uh, development of a testing, testing kit. And also uh, related to that is probably the measure to uh, medicine or other measures to treat those infected and also the development of vaccines. Uh, in South Korea, uh, as I mentioned, the, the Infectious uh, Disease Control Act allows those KCDC and other uh, doctors to use those uh, specimens to further develop vaccines or treatment medicine or other measures. So they have uh, some legal system that is sponsored by 
uh, that sponsored this kind of a continuous medical development. And that is how they could come up with a very advanced testing kit in a such a short period of time. And also that's why they are kind of prospecting the vaccine can be developed within several months. And the United States had also loosened a little bit of that procedure and we are trying our best to rapidly developing the vaccines, but it is not something that happened without effort. So the United States, we should also think uh, whether we are taking the best kind of measure, uh, approaches and measures to fight this, uh, fight against this COVID-19 situation. If there is anything, any one small thing that we can do further, we should do it. And uh, this kind of a crisis really needs our prompt response rather than a little bit of a delays and kind of a uh, waiting, wait and see approach. Yeah, especially now when we're going back, going back to businesses, going back to schools, going back to restaurants. Uh, the system that Korea has devised so successfully is really critical now, and we have to follow that uh, in as religious a manner as we possibly can. Well, thank you, Tang and Bike. It's been really helpful to talk to you, uh, and I really appreciate you coming around to help us understand this global process. Thank you thank so you much. Thank you very much for having me, and it was always nice to see you. The same here, Tang. Take care. Stay okay, well. Bye. Bye.